Hello, everybody. Welcome to Airway Answers, Expanding Your Breath of Knowledge. I'm the host, Nicole Goldfarb. I'm a speech language pathologist and certified oral facial myologist. And this podcast and YouTube is through Airway Circle Radio. So we thank them for having us do this. And I'm so excited today. This is episode six with Ken Hooks. Woo! Okay. I've been so excited. <laughs> Ta -da! I've been so excited to talk with Ken. Um, I met Ken a few years ago at a conference, at an IAOM conference, and then again at a couple other conferences. Um, I think it was at the APMD in Nashville. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I chased him. I'm like, Ken, it's me. Um, <laughs> he's amazing. So I'm going to give a little bio about Ken and talk about why I wanted to have him today on this show. Um, so Ken Hooks, and you probably already know him. He's the founder and operator of True Sleep Diagnostics. Ken is a registered respiratory therapist with 10 years of experience and a registered polysomnographic technologist for adults and pediatrics with nine years of experience. Ken is a former sleep medicine representative for the Bon Secure. I don't know how you say that. <laughs> the what? It's French, right? How do you it say is that? Bon Secure. <laughs> Bon it is Secor, yeah. Bon Secor. Okay, I thought I would do some like French accent. St. Francis <laughs> in Greenville, South Carolina. And he's also the clinical director and instructor of the polysomnographic technician course at Greenville Technical College. He co-authored the case report Rapid Maxillary Expansion and Adenotonsillectomy in Nine-Year-Old Twins with Pediatric OSA, an interdisciplinary effort. So um, Ken is an amazing respiratory therapist, knows everything above and beyond about sleep, sleep studies, testing sleep, all the details. One of the reasons I find Ken fascinating is because he truly understands airway resistance. I don't know if all sleep technicians get that because we know on so many sleep studies, they miss that respiratory effort and are just looking at oxygen uh, desaturations, I believe. Um, and I've used Ken and his private company to do sleep studies for my family. And also I took Ken's True Sleep course recently, a seven hour amazing course. He can talk a little bit about it at the end. Um, that was an online course that was everything and beyond about sleep. I learned so much. I feel like I need to watch it again because it's so detailed. It's like a college level prep course for actually becoming um a sleep technician. I feel like it's like a step one. There's so many details. And one of the things I was really fascinated with is um, not just the details about sleep studies, but also medications and their effects on sleep. And there's a whole section of this seven part or seven hour course that's on medications, melatonin, um, SSRIs, everything, and how they affect the different stages of sleep, which I find really fascinating as well. So, um, Today, Ken's going to do a presentation called the Upper Airway Resistance, and it's going to be great. So, um, Ken, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One I, thing um, I forgot to do. Okay. This is kind of silly, but I, I'm like, I have to remember my mug. Okay. Oh, sorry. My mug. Wait, is it showing up? Okay. Ah, okay. Airway Answers <laughs> from Airway Circle Radio. Renata got me this mug, Renata and the crew from Airway Circle at the APMD. Um, where were we? In Arizona, just a couple of weeks ago. And um, yeah. that was that was sweet. So I, I promised I'd use my mug for my little shows. And <laughs> so Ken, are you ready to um, talk to us about the upper airway resistance so we can all get a better understanding of what is going on in the airway that's causing problems? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm geared up. <laughs> I swear uh, this is. I'm so, I'm so, I don't know why I'm so nervous. I don't know if it's you do not even so, need to be nervous. Oh, okay. No, I'm, no preemptive that Ken is funny, but like if you take a <laughs> true sleeps course, which I recommend to everyone, I was laughing out loud. And sometimes I listen as I'm going for my run and I get my, you know, education, my CEs while I'm running. And I probably look like a crazy person because I would just like bust up laughing as I'm running by <laughs> myself because some of the things you. <laughs> We were saying so yeah there's no need to be nervous we are all fun and games here <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah it's fun i'm i'm ready to learn all right i'm gonna pull it up 
I think I need to do this differently because. Um, yeah, I think you're good Is when, that it? well, put it in presenter mode um, because I can see your slides on the side. This is it. That's awesome. You got it. Okay, sweet. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the upper air resistance. It focuses on, uh, I don't want to say the people, like the um, the little guys that cause some upper air resistance and trouble uh, for breathing at night. And really and truly, we find more that upper air resistance is the cause of a lot of breathing problems, more so than weight, because we do have patients, for instance, that have a BMI of like 15, 17, 20, and they have the worst sleep apnea. Um, sleep apnea being the term of uh, like nocturnal breathing disturbance. And uh, I guess, let me say this first. The first thing I want to say, I'm going to go on a rant uh, immediately is- um, Wait, what kind of rant? sleep apnea. A deodorant? I just said a deodorant rant because it stinks. <laughs> because it stinks. I'm going on a deodorant rant. So- um, sleep apnea, the term itself, <laughs> is um, it's kind of a misnomer for breathing disturbance because it it's the apnea is an obstruction, um, ninety percent or greater obstruction of the airway. And when we think about sleep apnea, we always think that we stop breathing. And that's not true. So nocturnal breathing disturbance is the term that I like to use. Sleep disorder breathing um, is another term or another phrase that people use because that better describes breathing trouble at night, breathing disturbances more so than sleep apnea. And we'll talk about what an apnea is and what it looks like to give you a better idea and also how it compares to upper air resistance because truly physiologically, the impact is the same. Um, we just have to go by what insurance says is, is significant in order for them to pay for certain things. So we're gonna keep it going. Um, this is me. The indigenous detractors, that was the subtitle. Yeah, I was because I was trying to be funny. And then this is me. So the let's face facts. It's a double entendre pun of the century. So you can use that in your spare time. We're going to talk about the resistance. That's in bold because that kind of is the whole thing. They're the most important universal signs. You know, there's universal signs and everything like stop. Uh, I don't want to say peace because in Australia that means something different. Thumbs up is like good. You know, it, but we got to have universal signs for um, upper air resistance and people who might have breathing problems. Uh, we're talking about breathing a little bit, uh, the nasal pharynx, um, flow and respiratory events, a shocking report, which is a, a true report of um, someone here, not locally, but in the state of South Carolina. Symptoms and comorbidities, which breaks down how sleep affects everything. I'm that guy that says sleep affects everything. Um, and then show and tell, I'll talk about one of the uh, patients that I had a case on early on. So this is me and my friend Kevin long ago when I was a young kid and had a black beard. So if we look at me, my mouth's open. So one thing that I did not, I wonder, can I do a pointer on here? Nope. Let me, uh, okay, laser pointer. So mouth is open. My tongue is right down here. The hyoid bone is connected to the tongue, it's floating. And so my tongue is actually down in the airway. When the mouth is open, it's closer to the, to the posterior portion of the airway. And then I also got this little crick here. So I'm crimping the airway and my tongue is sliding back. So this is double trouble. And this probably looks like all of your husbands and boyfriends and friends when they go to sleep on the couch um, watching something. <laughs> Amazingly boring, that's not football. And my friend, literally, Kevin said, Is he, you think he's dead? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, I'm still here. <laughs> the resistance down with the airflow. We have Tungu. He's a rebel, as you can tell by his really cool hat. He's too harsh for the mouth. <laughs> this is an indicator of a uh, problem. Uh, scallop tongue, there's pressure on a small mouth, so to speak. Um, there's a, He's tied down with his brother who we'll meet. He doesn't press up against the palate or the maxilla to spread it. 
Um, when you spread the maxilla, you also spread the nasal floor, give the nasal floor a nice balance. And he'll try to escape the mouth if he doesn't have enough space. So his brother, yeah, is next. Tungu Tai. He holds his brother back from potential greatness. And one thing about a tongue tie is I'm noticing that, um, and I almost I feel weird saying this, but even a mild tongue tie can have some sort of impact on facial growth. And I recently saw a patient who's 13 years old who had a tongue tie release and he had some orthodontic work done. And I saw a pre and post coming CT. And while the parents thought everything was great, they still felt like he had a problem. Well, he did. The comb beam before and after about eight months apart, I believe it was, or maybe a year apart, looked almost exactly the same. Um, there was a little bit of expansion on the on the maxilla, but at the same time, um, the tongue had low tone and was very low. And the soft palate was at an angle like this. The uvula is coming down this way is behind him. So he can feel his, his uvula just in normal routine. Um, so tongue tied, no matter how mild, can be important. You got to assess, assess the full picture. Uh, Vaulted Palat, he's my favorite. <laughs> Um, you know, male, male deficiency or sufficiency with the flat cheeks, um, dental crowding or a small mouth, um, uh, decreased nasal space. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. And uh, we'll kind of get a picture of what that looks like. But if you do have a vaulted palate, this pressure is going to be pushing up on the nose, potentially deviating the septum. Um, if one side of the tongue is weaker than the other side, you may see also one side of the nose more vaulted and turbinate space being compromised. Uh, so we'll have decreased nasal space, um, decreased inspired air. There'll be increased resistance more than we're supposed to have. There is supposed to be some resistance that helps keep the little air sacs in the lungs open. But if we have increased and that throws increased beyond that, that throws everything off. And then we have a failure to thrive because we can't get the appropriate volume into the body that the lungs are used to. And that makes you want to pop the mouth open and breathe that way. And then hyperactive airways. Sometimes um, asthma is misdiagnosed. Sometimes it's hyperactive airways. Hyperactive airways are when the airways do spasm due to increased turbulence or dry air. And if the nasal space is compromised, it can't warm and humidify the air the way it should for the airways. So they may spasm. Book aisle space. <laughs> ah, this was my favorite. Not, <laughs> not Ted. <laughs> so he's seen with vaulted palat. He puts the squeeze on dentition. So we see right here uh, the increased buccal space, making for a small mouth. Not a big tongue, but a small mouth. Four hour breathing. This always makes me think of Superman, but he's got this cool bandana on because he's. <laughs> <laughs> I like that guy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> He emerges when the resistance is flourishing, uh, when the nasal space is compromised, when there's a vaulted palate, um, when there's some retronathia, we get this open mouth posture to try to get some air into or some volume into the lungs that they feel like um, they're doing the job they're supposed to do. And retronathia, she's beautiful. She's cute. Uh, she's a demon. <laughs> she's cute, right? Look at the hair. Love I did the that, hair. by the way. No, I'm just kidding. Love the hair. <laughs> she's got a Dyson curling iron. <laughs> so <laughs> there's reduced pharyngeal space when she appears. Um, the retronathia or chin recession, I talked to patients about this. If it's present, then we have reduced airway space automatically because the mandible and the tongue really dictate that pharyngeal space. The more or the less um, mandibular advancement a patient has, the less space they have in the airway, um, in the pharynx. She's married to oral breathing because a lot of times, well, I'm not going to say a lot of times, sometimes we'll see retronathium patients that that um, have open mouth posture, open mouth breathing. One thing I want to say too about open mouth posture and open mouth breathing is the lips aren't necessarily the mouth, it's the teeth. You can have your lips closed and on the inside of your lips, your teeth can be open. This is me. I, I do the same. I do that. So the teeth, when the teeth are further apart, when that mandible is dropped, the hyoid drops, the tongue slides back into the airway. So the teeth are the guidance on um, open mouth posture. So Sarah, you're breathing through your mouth again. And Sarah's like, yeah, well, I can't breathe any other way, Melissa. So 
Universal signs of resistance. That was a nice segue. I I enjoy what I do sometimes. So choking, right? You this guy, you don't have to, he has to say nothing else. You know he's choking. When we look at him, we should automatically know that there's a breathing problem. Um he has almost every sign in the book. He has the sunken orbits or allergic shiners, malar deficiency or insufficiency, the flat cheeks. His lips right here, you can tell if he was to smile really big, there'd be a tremendous amount of buckle space. The teeth don't even have enough. There's not enough teeth to make the lips spread wide. <laughs> He's got some muscles under here um, from the swallowing. They're using He has to use the musculature here to swallow. Um, what else we got? Oh, he probably has an upper lip tie too. Um, there's a increase uh vaulted palate potentially if he smiles he potentially have a gummy smile looking at the space right here next one again just about the same thing he has no choice but to open mouth breathe because this nose is probably severely compromised male insufficiency sunken orbits or allergic shiners again this downward uh top lip here so there's nothing no teeth that's pushing out right here so the tongue as you probably can imagine is resting right at the bottom of the mouth in the airway. So this is a real human. I say that because those are from Google. Um, this gentleman, um, I know his father and his father said, can you test my son with a home sleep test? I said, sure. And he said, you know, I really think his problem is that he vapes. And I said, I, I'm not going to say anything, but I don't think vaping is the problem with his sleep. And he goes, okay, well, just tell me what you find. So uh, he really did have some pretty, pretty good upper air resistance. We can see the sunken orbits, the flat cheeks with him as well. Um, when we look a lot closer, we can see some increased buckle space. We see some dental crowding. So these are signs that when you see a patient, they may have a compromised airway. Um, these will be our universal signs, so to speak. If you look at the side profile, we see that he is a little bit AP deficient. We come down from this glabella line. Well, we really can't because it's kind of at a quarter angle, but um, there is a little bit of retinaphia here. <laughs> Mama, I'm breathing. So what is breathing all about? It's the assembly line of life. The reason that we breathe is Carbon dioxide, we have two mechanisms, actually. Carbon dioxide is our primary, oxygen is our secondary for patients that have scarred lungs or uh, not scarred lungs, like COPD or damaged to lungs. Um, negative pressure is the driver of breathing. Negative pressure, when the lungs expand, negative pressure is created, pulls air in the body. Our ideal body weight usually is how we calculate the minute ventilation. Uh, we'll do it about six to eight mils per kg. This is something that the lungs are used to. And um, if they get less than this, then they may um, expand. You may get um, airway spasm. Um, you may go into for sleep during the while you're awake is different. But when you're asleep, um, the physiology may change. You may get pulse rate spikes. You may toss and turn. Um, inspiratory and expiratory timing. We inspire at one second. We exhale at two seconds. The oral nasal pharynx is the topic of our discussion because this can throw off everything the body is trying to do naturally, naturally um, with breathing. So carbon dioxide, we have a certain level. Once um, it rises to the peak of that level, that triggers our body to want to breathe. The diaphragm drops, the lungs expand, air comes into the body, better through the nose and the mouth. And then when we exhale, the diaphragm goes up and all the air shoots out of our body. <laughs> you station, <laughs> this truck's got some bad turbinates. <laughs> the turbinates need to be changed out. So the turbinates are really important. Um, the inferior ones that have the most importance, they're really big. Um, the superior ones up here do help guard our sense of smell. There's nerves from the olfactory bulb um, that, that penetrate through here, but these turbinates protect that. These inferior turbinates and middle turbinates, um, they're lined with cilia. They're also lined with mucous membrane, and they help warm and humidify air. They help trap contaminants and things like that. 
they also increase surface area. So on the outside, I know it looks tiny, but on the inside, we have the surface area here that allows air to go out and through. And it also slows that air down. So it doesn't smack into the eustachian tube and give you vertigo. As you can see right here, the hard palate is the floor of the nose. If this hard palate is vaulted or if there's any pressure on this hard palate, the septum right here will deviate one side to another or the other. If we have a tongue weakness on one side or the tongue is tied and it's causing one side to be weaker, one of these sides will be vaulted. We'll see it almost like an angle of this here. Maybe this side is flat, this side is angled. This maxillary sinus right here will be smaller than this one, and this turbinate will look like it needs to be reduced only because the airway space around it is compromised. No one's turbinates look like these kidney beans here. <laughs> this is like a perfect example of good airway. Um, so humidification and warming only happens through the nose. You don't humidify air through the mouth. Um, you don't warm air through the mouth. It provides up to, these turbinates provide up to 98% water saturation. That helps with the humidity, of course. It prevents hyperactive airways, which talked about can be called asthma sometimes. Mouth breathing reduces water saturation by 60 to 70%. So dry lips, dehydration, um, um, unhumidified or cold air going to the lungs can always cause problems. It has a filtration, sneezes, and mucociliary transport. Whenever I see someone hold a sneeze in, I always say, you don't even know you're about to kill yourself. You don't even know. You don't even know because your body's trying to get rid of something unless it's like perfume. Then it's not. It just doesn't know better. Mucociliary transport, that's not, or mucus. Um, increased surface area, I talked about that. Reduces flow for the eustachian tube, yep. And in kids, the eustachian tube is a lot closer to the back of um, the nasal pharynx or the, the nose area. It's a lot closer to that than adults. As we grow, it kind of spreads out. So for kids, if there is any inflammation in the nose or behind the nose, or if the palate is not right, or these turbidates aren't right, um, we can cause the adenoids to swell and it'll block it off. And of course, the ears can't drain all the mucus and, and snot and detritus out of the ears and they have to get tubes. Creates back pressure. So the resistance that we naturally have creates back pressure to keep the little air sacs in our lungs open so it can get air that comes in and put it in our blood, send it to the heart to oxygenate the body. If that is compromised, we may have a lower rest in oxygen saturation because the air sacs either aren't all the way open or the body, the periphery, and the organs are used to having a lower saturation because the heart can't supply um, a higher saturation. Can um, you pause directly you for posterior one second? Period. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, is, this is not about this, but when you talk, it's a little um, popping, like your speakers are making uh -huh. a popping sound. Okay. But, yeah. So I'm I wondering. Have to switch. It... Okay. Either Let that or I don't know, lower the volume. I don't want to stand up because I don't have pants, so I got shorts on. No worries, no one can see. I don't. I don't <laughs> want to be on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Was it? Are you using like an earbud for the speaker? I am. Yeah. Okay. It, it's kind of like rustling, popping sound. I was like, I. I think we we need to change that if possible. Okay. Let me see if. Okay. Let's test that out. Okay, talk. Uh oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> I shouldn't have made you stop. Um, yeah, I can't hear you. So now I can hear you. Wait. Okay, there it goes. Oh, that now you're good. You're good. Okay. Perfect. Sorry okay. about that. Sorry about that. Okay, keep on going. By the way, I, I have to mute myself because I keep laughing and I know on Zoom it'll like just go to whosoever voice he hears and I don't want to mess up what you're saying as I'm like laughing out loud. Uh -huh. So I'm muting myself, but I am laughing in my in the background because there are really <laughs> I'm really Eustacia. There's some funny things there. All right. There you go. I'm gonna mute me. Okay, so 
Someone knows. Someone knows a little something about something else. Um, eustachian tube is directly posterior inferior to the turbinates. Um, it's surrounded by adenoid tissue. I kind of just said this drains mucus from the middle ear. Pressure stabilization, if that eustachian tube is compromised or if the adenoids lock it off, or if we have a lot of airflow pressure smacking into it, you will get dizzy and have vertigo. Um, and it's more horizontal impedes the the pathway from the nose to the eustachian tube um, versus adults. So this side view here would, this is supposed to be the perfect picture. Um, this patient has a good tongue posture, allegedly just roll with me. Um, the hyoid bone you see right here is what the tongue is connected to. So if this is low, you can see how it will pull the tongue down. Uh, we got the epiglottis here. This tongue can slam and seal off the epiglottis. It also can go straight back and seal off the nasal pharynx. Um, if it just is kind of hanging out for patients that do have a tongue tie, sometimes it's good because if they didn't, the tongue has such low tone, maybe it wouldn't have low tone, but has such low tone that it holds it here. And it'll just cause snoring as this air tries to scoot by the uvula and the tongue. Um, terminates we see from the side. The hard palate here that's going into the soft palate to the vellum. This is the vellum pharynx here. Sometimes we'll see with the patients with low tongue tone or tongue posture, this will be angled down. And so even if we do everything in our power to fix the tongue and put it in the right place, um, the palate would be a problem and we may have to do something about that there. So person with low tongue tone, low tongue posture, we have a vaulted palate, which is really exaggerated. It doesn't necessarily look like that. but um, we have open mouth breathing. We have the tongue more in the airway. And um, I did pull like a little dip here, but it's supposed to be back here for the hyoid. The genial hyoid won't dip, but the hyoid will dip down. So this is a straw and that's it. That's all I got. No, I'm just kidding. So if we breathe and we have resistance, <laughs> it's supposed to just come in and go down into the lungs. But if we have something that increases resistance and it causes a struggle for the air to come down, the lungs are pulling and pulling and pulling, it's going to collapse the airway or aid in airway collapse. So small nasal space can potentially narrow the airway. It'll increase resistance. It'll increase pressure, um, will decrease the flow and increase pressure. We'll now have this turbulent airflow causing some trouble in the airway versus having a nice laminar airflow with good volume. Um, uh, pressure and volume are inversely related in the system. Um, decrease oxygen to the heart. You'll decrease oxygen to non-vital organs. I don't know if you ever heard of cold hands, warm heart, but it comes from the concept of um, the periphery being so used to being um, not oxygenated that they become colder and more purple or bluish because the core is, wants to have all of the blood flow and um, that's for our safety. Sympathetic nervous system activates because it says that there is a problem. This is not how the body is supposed to operate. We'll have anxieties and things. The heart pumps faster so that we can get oxygenated blood to the body because the body says, I want oxygen, especially the liver. The liver wants oxygen so bad. He's ridiculous. And the gut also wants some good bit of oxygen. So that's this is a nice wave, Harriet. And Harriet says, thanks, it's a flow wave. So the next thing we'll talk about is flow waves. What do airflow waves look like when we look at a sleep study? So this first one here, this is on a home sleep test. And I know that because we have one flow. Um, in lab tests, we'll have two. One is a, for temperature change, we do apnea. This is a pressure transducer, which I love because it shows me the shape or dynamics of airflow for a patient. So we have resistance here. This resistance, however, for this patient doesn't matter because there's no physiological parameters um, that uh, lead to trouble. So we got airflow here. We got effort here. The airflow be or the belt on the chest. Uh, pulse rate is here. SpO2 is oxygen here. Body position is right. The pleth, I love using the pleth. This helps me figure out if airflow limitation is actually significant or not. This is every wave form of this pleth is actually a heartbeat. And the amplitude or height of this is the blood flow volume going to the periphery. 
So this gives you an idea of reduced blood flow um, going to the periphery. You can see this patient's oxygen saturation is 93. They're a little bit older, but also they have this inherent resistance um, with their breathing. So that could also cause this lower oxygen saturation. So this should be a nice sinus wave. We should have inspiration going up and expiration coming down. Here we have a good bit of resistance on the front end. I would like to believe this is nasal resistance. The kale is in the nose. So this is where it starts. It starts at the beginning of inspiration. Uh, we'll see some where the resistance is more in the middle and at the top. Those will be more oropharyngeal resistances. Um, it's kind of hard to tell if it is nasal or not because if the tongue is falling back on the nasal pharynx or the uvula and saw palate, um, it may look like this as well. So um, this is a picture of good health. Um, this is an in-lab study where we have the third mister flow. It always looks perfect because it goes on temperature change. Um, cold air out, hot air, or um, hot air out, cold air in. So cold air is inspiration, hot air is expiration. If there's no temperature change, then there's no airflow, and we would call that an apnea. Here we have the cannula. This is a lot uh, better as far as visually. Uh, nice sinus wave going there. Um, here we have reduced amplitude, so there may be some restriction there. We got two belts in the lab in the pulse rate, and SpO2 is oxygen saturation. Here we have the pleth. Anytime we see something funky in the pleth, something funky is going on with the heart. This translates into uh, some sort of heart abnormality. So here I want to show you some airflow limitation. This is a two minute screen. Down here, we do see a little bit of snoring. Now, this may not come, uh, this may not be audible, but uh, there's increased turbulence in the, in the airway here. This is a little bit strange to start off with because there probably was some sort of airflow limitation or respiratory vent there. We got a lot of amplitude here. So this is a big volume of breath here. Then it kind of drops off. We start reducing amplitude here. And then the body says something ain't right. We got to fix it. So this area right here is actually airflow limitation. This almost was a bad one because this isn't normal before. But we do get to see a nice volume reduction here. We also get to see how the body responds to that airflow limitation. Now, one thing I want to show you is this pulse rate of this oxygen saturation. It's 97, 96 right here, and back to 97. There's no desaturation. but the heart goes from 68, 69, 70 to 100. And the pulse of the SpO2 pleth, as you can see throughout this, is starting to get a little funky. The heart's not responding too well to what's going on here. So this would actually be airflow limitation. This is significant. This is something that can't be tabulated on a sleep test, be it home sleep test or in lab, because it doesn't meet the qualifications for apnea. There's still breath here. And it doesn't meet the qualifications for hypopnea because there's no dramatic desaturation of three or four percent. So when the sleep study is looked at for a patient that does not have uh, clinical sleep apnea as, as by insurance guidelines, but they say, I'm still tired, still have headaches. Um, you know, these things are going on. This potentially is what's happening. Um, pulse rate to me is the best indicator of trouble. Not necessarily oxygen saturation, especially in kids. They're super resilient. Um, their oxygen saturation almost doesn't move all night, but the pulse tells the tale of everything. Flow limitation there. So sleep architecture. If you sleep, they will come. Talking about sleep staging. So here are my two friends uh, working on sleep architecture. He says, this here is a, a, a stage two or three. And my man says, well, maybe it's REM. So the reason for this slide, it's kind of comical, is because sleep staging and scoring is in the eye of the beholder. The gold standard for correctness on a sleep study is 80%. So there's a 20% margin of error. Now, who judges that 20%? Well, on a yearly basis or a monthly basis, um, sleep technicians are supposed to either get with a physician or with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and score sleep studies to make sure that they're always above 80% correctness on these studies. Now, everybody's different. Everybody's perception is different. Even though we have rules, some technicians have been in this longer and they understand certain things. Some have not been as long and they kind of go by the book. Um, but through the whole thing, 
we have to remember that 20% margin of error is a gold standard, which can account for a lot. Sleep stages. There's four sleep stages. Wake is not one of them. We used to always get people in class with this. So sleep stages run off of EEG frequency or electroencephalograph frequency. We got stage N1, which is very light. We got N2, um, where we start going more into sleep. We have three which is deep sleep. N4 used to be deep sleep too, but we no longer use that. We only do three. Very slow waves. And then we have REM, which is a light stage of sleep. It's very fast brain activity. So when you think about REM and fast activity, I want you to think about daydreams. If you daydream, you're going in between being awake in stage one and REM, and you're coming out of it and going back in it. Um, so REM is a light stage of sleep. Arousals, when we score an arousal for a patient, and it has to be at least three seconds long, it has to be an increase of EEG speed. Um, there has to be 10 seconds of sleep preceding this three-second increase in EEG speed. And in REM, we need to have a chin burst to count the arousal. So in REM sleep, everything's paralyzed except for the diaphragm. Usually we'll see patients, uh, if they have nocturnal breathing disturbance, it'll be a lot worse in REM sleep um, than it will be during non-REM sleep. So an arousal. This probably it looks like just some kind of foreign substance, but these are all brain waves. Um, these little channels right here are the channels or the locations that we put the leads for the EEG. Um, this would be like a stage two here. We got 10 seconds of good sleep right here, but then we got some trouble. We got to speed up. So when I say a speed up of EEG, these waves, the distance between the wave tells how fast. If there's a little bit of distance, you can't really see between the waves, that's a fast wave. These bigger waves that are slower, those are slower waves. So the, the more width you see or the more distance between is a slower wave. So we got really fast waves over here. They're darker because they're so close together. We also have a chin burst right here um, and really right here just as this arousal is beginning. So this is what an arousal would look like on a sleep study that square there arousal in rim so this is rim sleep very fast activity here very fast activity here extremely fast activity here we do have just a little bit of increase in this chin channel this channel is the chin it remains flat it's the thinnest during rim sleep and the way that we tell if there's a some sort of bruxism or something going on uh, with teeth grinding is a deflection or a blip on this channel. So we do see an increase or raised area here. So we would count this as an arousal in REM. Notice that they had this arousal and they went right back into REM. So this would be something that we would see like in a daydream. Um, it's a lot more dangerous and harming at night when you sleep. So let's talk about these stages. Stage one, you're transitioning in and out of sleep. It's very light. Um, the brain activity is starting to slow down. The body temperature is starting to decrease and melatonin production starts to increase. Body temperature and melatonin uh, work together. So when your body temperature is low, melatonin is high. When your body temperature raises, melatonin decreases. Um, at the pinnacle of nighttime sleep, our body temperature is the lowest. I think it's like 97 degrees or something around there. And the melatonin production is the highest. should be in a perfect world. When we wake up, our body temperature actually spikes to, I think, 101.6 or something like that. That shuts the melatonin off, makes you want to wake up. Um, for patients that have difficulty going to sleep, we can use cold therapy where you decrease the ambient temperature to help produce melatonin. Also, you can take melatonin. I, I always am really funny about saying that. Um, 0.1 milligram to one milligram is the recommended dosage. It is a hormone. And the more you take, the less your body will produce. It should be taken as the night falls, as everything is getting dark, because your perception will perceive the darkness. It'll hit the pineal gland, which produces this melatonin, and it'll produce it. Um, so taking melatonin as nightfall is, is the best time. Stage one. This is what stage one looks like. Um, we're starting to slow down a little bit. There's a calmness over this. This is how I describe it, a calmness, a peacefulness over these EEGs. Um, the chin is, this is a little pop here, this artifact, but the chin is nice and stable. The eyes are nice and stable, just a little bit of rolling here. Stage two, 
you are starting to become disengaged from your surroundings. Your body temperature decreases, continues to decrease, and your brain activity slows even more. So the more deeper you're into sleep, the slower the brainwave activity. Stage two is still considered a light stage of sleep, relatively speaking, because you're not disengaged from your surroundings. You can still be startled or awakened by something ambient, um, noises, uh, car horns or things like that, somebody talking or laughing. You ever try to sleep at a dinner party? It's not going to happen. Unless you're me. I fall asleep anywhere. I fell asleep at a uh, Lady Annabellum concert. It's crazy. Man, it's, it was a good concert. The part I saw. I also fell asleep at a UFC fight. It was crazy in Atlanta. It's nuts. But I'm, I'm under control now. Thanks. So this is stage two here. Um, as you could tell, potentially, this is a lot slower than stage one. Stage one, everything was kind of tightly knit. Uh, we do have a slower EEG here. We also have some K complexes that let you know we're in, in stage two. Um, the eyes are really not moving. This kind of artifact you see here from this from these K complexes in the EEG. Stage three, the deepest and most restorative stage of sleep, along with stage four, our blood pressure drops. We do have a blood pressure dipping at night. For patients that don't have a blood pressure dip, and they typically start to trend towards having higher blood pressure during the day, breathing becomes slower. In the deep stages of sleep, you aren't paralyzed, but you typically don't move. You usually get your best sleep in, in the deeper stages. You usually don't move at all. Um, the muscles are relaxed. Blood supply to the oxygen or to the muscles increases. Tissue growth and repair. Energy is restored. Memories are compiled and consolidated. So all throughout the night, those K-complexes that we showed, um, there's things that go on throughout sleep that like just grasp memories, grasp memories. And in stage three, we're starting to bring all that stuff together. We're starting to kind of pile it together. Um, we have some hormones relief for growth and development. Growth hormone affects a lot. Some women with uh, hormonal deficiencies have reduced stage three. Some men with like weird alopecia have growth hormone um, deficiency from reduced deep sleep. Night terrors occur in deep sleep. Nightmares occur in REM. A night terror is a night terror because a child or an adult is completely disengaged from everything. They can't feel anything. They can't hear anything. They really, for the most part, can't see anything. Whatever they're dreaming about is um, their truth at that moment. And so, a night terror would happen in stage three or stage four as the patient is completely disengaged. However, um, they're startled enough to be arisen and then they will just fall back asleep like nothing happened and they won't remember it. The glymphatic system is a new system, a trash waste system in the body that was found out um, maybe about a decade ago now, um, if not maybe just a, a close to a decade. But this is the brain's waste system through cerebral spinal fluid. So all the protein plaque, like amyloid beta, that builds up during the day when um, when we're walking around all this stuff, it is eliminated through cerebral spinal fluid during this time. If your stage three is broken up or if it doesn't exist, this process is likely to not happen. Nor norepinephrine can fill the space when the sympathetic nervous system is active. So when you're having some airflow resistance, um, when you're having some tossing and turning, anything that will keep you out of stage three or is causing fragmentation of your stage three will cause this system not to work appropriately because the cerebral spinal fluid will be filled with norepinephrine. So deep sleep is really important. This is deep sleep, really slow waves. We can see a lot of space in between all of these waves. Again, this, these eyes are static, but there's artifact coming from the EEG because they're so close. Um, this would be actually stage four because greater than 50% is slow waves. But this is what deep sleep looks like here. REM or rapid eye movement, which is the most well-known. I feel like it's the sleep rock star. The brain is actually very active. Um, memories and thoughts are locked away here. So in stage three, everything is kind of compiled and put together. They're locked away here. Um, energy is provided to the brain and the body, which, which supports daytime performance. Nightmares happen here. Parasomnias can happen in, in deep sleep and in REM sleep. Um, the nightmare, as opposed to the night terror, you, can be interrupted. 
Um, you can wait from a nightmare and remember it. You can be awakened from your nightmare. Um, this also is when the amygdala depotentiate or wash or refresh. The amygdala are two pieces of matter that are part of our fear-based system. And this really uh, dictates who we are, how we're shaped um, from day-to-day -day experience. So if today six people jump out from, uh, I'm going into Lowe's Foods or CVS, and every time I walk into CVS, somebody jumps out. So if my amygdala don't depotentiate, tomorrow I'll be afraid to go to CVS because the system that is being built cannot be washed. That tomorrow, that should even affect me. If everything with my system was perfect, I would go into CVS like nothing happened. I would remember and I'd say, man, it's crazy yesterday that happened, but I wouldn't be afraid to do it. Amygdala depotentiation also uh, goes hand in hand with PTSD, holding on to traumas, anxiety. You become more archaic the more this amygdala does not refresh itself. Um, our synapses are reduced, just like you'll see in depression. Um, whereas when we get good sleep, good REM sleep and consolidated, we can build new synapses. It's easier for us to learn and grasp things and have a better memory. So REM sleep, very important. Consolidated. And this is REM sleep here. Kind of looks like stage one. Very fast activity. Um, we don't have too much. We do have a phasic eye movement here. It'd be nice to show you something that actually was rapid eye movement. but we have a little bit here, um, very fast activity. I'll show you another, oh, I did put one here. So here's a rapid eye movement or a phasic eye movement here. All the rest of this is tonic rim because there's no eye movements. These waves right here are called shark tooth or shark teeth waves. That's a uh, significant or a sign of rim sleep. So, <laughs> I mean, you stop breathing, so I call it EMS. Man, wouldn't this be a crazy world if every time we saw somebody have apnea, we like call the police or EMS? <laughs> the hospitals would be full. So let's talk about these actual terms. What is an apnea? The word apnea means without breath. Um, the definition in the realm of sleep is, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm, I'm going to tell you on the next slide. So there's two flow sensors on a sleep study in lab. There's one sensor at home when you do a home sleep test. The two in the lab are the thermistor we talked about. It picks up um, temperature change. If there's no temperature change, there's no breath. So we would mark an apnea. And then the pressure transducer, um, you can see a flat line there as well as the tongue slides back in the airway and obstructs it. So there are different types of apnea. Obstructive apnea is the one we are more um, versed and we know the most of. Central apnea is starting to become more of a thing now, but it actually is not as prevalent um, as people would think. Two effort belts. Um, we have one on the chest and then kind of one on the diaphragm. They use two in the lab so we can see paradoxical breathing. But if we have some sort of airflow resistance or if we have a respiratory vent, we don't necessarily need to know that this is happening. We, we see everything that's going on. So that's just another layer of um, of there's just something else we can add to say that there's a problem here. All respiratory events have to be 10 seconds in length. So no matter if it's apnea, hypopnea, rear, they have to be 10 seconds. This is different than being awake. When you're awake, it's five seconds. And if you don't breathe for five seconds, you are in trouble. You're turning blue. It's different because um, we are awake and our body expects us to be awake and active. When we're asleep, we're actually in a dead light state where we don't metabolize. Everything is kind of shut down. So it is a little bit longer. Um, now, should that be correct? <laughs> Probably not. Things can happen. You can have trouble in, in less than 10 seconds. Um, the system built around sleep diagnostics is, is geared towards a certain demographic. And that demographic usually has uh, respiratory events longer than that. Three types of apnea, obstructive, central, and mixed. Mixed is a combination. It starts off central and ends obstructive. Uh, central apnea is when the brain does not tell the body to breathe. This typically happens for some sort of physiological trouble or a natural response to a side breath or a gasp. Um, a side breath or a gasp when we are sleeping is, it seems harmless, but it happens for a reason. If we inhale, if we exhale two times longer than we inhale, you are blowing off a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. If you blow off too much carbon dioxide, the body's going to or the brain's going to wait till the levels rise back up and say, OK, now you can breathe again. That's a natural process. 
the central apneas that are primary or from could be uh, stroke, some kind of trauma to the respiratory center, um, fluid on the lungs, which would be kidney failure, uh, some sort of gut problem. Um, we have chemoreceptors in the lungs, and um, if those are affected, then they can't deliver messages properly to the brain. Um, two types of flow limitations. We have a hypopnea, which is, I'll oh, time to get ahead of myself, and we have a RERA, or respiratory effort-related arousal. Um, they're the same, but different. We used to go on RDI and sleep. This is almost 20 years ago now. I'm getting relatively old, um, kind of. And it, we used to go on RDI. RDI included respiratory effort-related arousals. This is airflow limitation that leads to an arousal that doesn't qualify as a hypopnea. So many patients qualified as having sleep apnea with the rearers included that insurance changed it. They said, oh, we're going on age high. It's not this many people have trouble. So or we don't want to pay for all this trouble. So we're going age high, which fits more of a demographic of overweight, a little bit older. Um, you know, as as we get older, our airway size decreases. The tongue never stops growing. If it's in the wrong place or has low tone, um, you will end up with your airway shrinking. Um, there's a case study done, which I totally forgot about, but I, I should have referenced that. And then the SPO2 plus, um, we saw a glimpse of that and why I think that's important. Um, that is not used very often, if at all, in the sleep lab. I love using it because it lets me know uh, truly if airflow limitation is significant. And then also if the patient does have some sort of um, cardiac weirdness that I, because I don't have EEG on the sleep, home sleep test. So apnea, minimum 10 seconds, volume reduction or amplitude reduction of 90% or greater. So that's just about full obstruction of the airway with the tongue. Um, we do have effort. So that's the effort from those belts. Or, yeah, oxygen saturation is irrelevant. You don't have to desat to have an apnea. In pediatrics, it's not 10 seconds, it's two missed breaths. They breathe a lot differently than we do as adults. So two consecutive missed breaths or more, continue effort and saturation is relevant there. So let's take a look at some adult apnea. I apologize, I don't have any uh, full pediatric sleep studies, but we'll take a look at some adult apneas here. So here we have no airflow. We're gonna start this respiratory event as soon as we start seeing a change in the airflow. So we start seeing a change about right here. We have zero airflow right here. And then we do still have effort. So the body's still trying to breathe. We still have effort, but we have no um, airflow coming in at all. So that's an obstructive apnea. We have it again here, no airflow at all. We do have some effort. And then we have it again here and here. This person's having some trouble. This is a little bit closer. We have the apneas here. We can see no airflow. We see effort. We also see a pulse rate spike, pulse rate spike. We do see oxygen desaturation here on these. Most times you do see them on apnea, even though that they don't have to be present. Central apnea. So minimum 10 seconds, uh, reduction in volume of 90% or greater. There is no effort to breathe at all. In kids, 20 seconds without breath is a central apnea. Also, if they have two consecutive missed breaths without effort, that's also a central apnea in peds. Again, saturation is irrelevant. So what does a central apnea look like? No flow, no effort at all. This patient is having something going on. So there's potentially some underlying comorbidity that's causing this patient to breathe this way. Um, these centrals are very prolonged. These lines here that I'm kind of sweeping in between are 30 seconds. So if you look at this, this is about 45 seconds here. This is about 45 seconds where the patient is not breathing at all. If we look closer, oh, I didn't highlight those. We see that there's no airflow at all and then no effort to breathe as well. Now, if the central apnea started closer to this big old side breath right here, the body's gasping sign right here. Big old inhale, big old exhale, in, out. So it blew off a lot of carbon dioxide there. I would expect the central apnea to be after there, really closer than that. 
um, but it's a little bit further out. So this is consistent. It's consistent with the whole night. Um, if we do have a chain of central apnea like this, I would say that that's significant versus just having it kind of here and there. Um, it may be the natural response of a side breath or gasp. Hypopnea. So uh, hypopnea means reduced airflow. That's what the word means. It's got to be 10 seconds. We got to see a volume reduction of at least 30%. Um, now, at this point, you're probably wondering, well, how do we know the percentage of reduction on these amplitudes? Well, you just kind of guess. You can actually um, drag a little something to see it, but it's more of a guess um, than it is science. So three or 4% oxygen desaturation. Medicare says only 4% will they pay for therapy. A lot of private payers will use 3%. In pediatrics, it is two consecutive breaths of volume reduction or more, um, 30%, a 3% oxygen des desaturation, or two breaths that end in an arousal. And this is in a uh, in lab study. So a home sleep test for a pediatric patient, whatever the AHI is, would be greater in lab, potentially, because you can't do these hypopneas on a home sleep test, being that we can't mark arousals. So again, the two consecutive breaths or more uh, for pediatrics, um, versus the 10 seconds in adults. So hypopnea, what does that look like? These hypopneas will be reduction of airflow. So the thermistor flow is on the top. This is the one that's not going to change unless we have an apnea because it's temperature driven. The cannula flow or pressure transducer is the one that we'd be able to tell reduction of airflow because the varying pressures in the airway. So right here, we know it's not an apnea because we have thermistor flow, but we don't have any pressure transducer flow at all. So um, airflow reduction. And then if we look at the oxygen saturation here, on the sleep test, this is a three, this oxygen saturation is actually three seconds behind. So we'll always see the desaturation occur after the respiratory event starts. So right here in the middle, we go 92 to 85. Um, the body's trying to recuperate. Well, it doesn't really have a chance because we got another hypopnea right here. So 92 to 88, and the body's trying to recuperate, doesn't really have a chance. We got another hypopnea here, 91 to 87. So hypopnea, we got a reduction in airflow and followed by an oxygen desaturation of three or 4%. And there it is. Flow limitation. The most important of every and all things we talk about is reduced volume of breathing, which is limitation, just like we saw in the hypopnea. Um, it'll be followed by a side breath or a gasp. There will be a pulse rate variance or fluctuation, um, usually a pretty good bit. Um, but three beats per minute and rising is significant. Anything within three beats per minute is normal. There also will be a variance in the SPL2 pleth. And all of this, the pulse rate in the SPL2 pleth, will let us know that the SNS is being active. So here, um, this is like the one we saw earlier. We got airflow limitation, we got a pulse rate spike, and we got some pleth madness. So even though we don't have oxygen desaturation, even though we don't have an apnea, this is important because the exact same thing that happens to the body with an apnea or hypopnea is happening right now with this airflow limitation. This will cause sleep fragmentation, breaking you out of your deep and REM sleep. Um, it'll also cause you not to be able to go into deeper REM sleep. And on the other side, it causes a good bit of fragmentation, causing you not to get any sleep at all. So you lay down for eight hours and you say, man, it feels like I slept two hours. Well, you probably did. It's probably six hours of just a whole bunch of flow limitation uh, where your body, your physiology or your brain is awake unbeknownst to you because you're unconscious. And the airflow limitation there. And we look at the pleth there. So. This is just a zoom in on um, what we just saw as far as the airflow limitation and how the pulse is affected by the airflow limitation. And the oxygen saturation is not, not at all. If you were just sitting at your desk right now and your baseline pulse rate is 69 and all of a sudden it goes to 100, you would feel like you're having a heart attack. That is 30 beats per minute greater than you're used to. And one thing I want to talk about, too, with this is normal ranges 
only apply as a whole. Every patient has their own normal range. If my pulse rate baseline is 50 to 55 and uh, Tim's pulse rate baseline is 70 to 72, if my pulse rate goes to 80, I'm going to feel it. It's going to feel like there's a problem. If his goes to 80, he may not feel like much. So even though we do have a normal range of um, in sleep, 40 to 90 is their normal range for pulse rate. Everybody's normal range is different. We all have our own range. Um, SPL2 plus. So this is a breakaway of a five minute screen. And we're going to highlight um, what the SPL2 PLEF does when we have a respiratory event. So here we have an apnea. This is on a home sleep test. No airflow. We do have effort. And also we have an airflow limitation right here. And we have a tiny airflow limitation right here. Now I highlight this tiny one for a reason because the airflow limitation size doesn't matter. The effect of the body is what matters. If some there's patients that are a lot more, their body's a lot more receptive to smaller airway resistance, so their pulse rate may fluctuate a lot more, um, non-discriminate on the the amplitude reduction or volume reduction of this airflow limitation. So, um, just because we see a little one doesn't mean that we shouldn't assess everything that's going on. So, um, oxygen saturation. I want you to see that this is static. 93 is the lowest. 95 is the highest. It's pretty stationary or um, through this whole, pretty consistent through this whole time, even though we're having these respiratory events. Look at the snoring. This snoring is audible and it is loud. Um, the amplitude or height of these blips is the loudness of the snore. And in addition to that, uh, let's look at this pulse rate, which is spiking after every time that we do have, even right here, um, every time that we do have some sort of airflow limitation. And in addition, we have SPL2 PLEF being uh, affected by this. So if you look the apnea, we have SPL2 PLEF being reduced. The airflow limitation, this is not hypopnea because we don't have a desaturation, is being affected the same way. The pulse rate spikes, it's being affected the same way with the airflow limitation. Even this tiny airflow limitation still has uh, SPL2 PLEF degradation or reduction. So it doesn't matter if it's apnea or hypopnea. Flow limitation has the exact same effect on the physiology as an apnea. Uh, this is just a closer look. And these are closer looks again. There's a lot of airflow limitation here. We see some side breaths or gas throughout there. We see pulse rate spikes throughout here, like here and here, right as these side breaths occur. And if you look at the SPL2 PLEF, this patient is very responsive to any airflow limitations that are occurring. And again, uh, SPL2 play for oxygen is nothing going on there. Um, again, same thing here. We have a lot of little flow airflow limitations, but the heart is being affected. Even right here, this is probably a PAC or PVC, as we see some abnormality there. Big old side breath and gasp. There's a little one right here. And um, just shows just it's affecting the ox or the uh, pulse rate there. So bruxism, bruxism is the grinding of the teeth, the little chiclets that we hold in our mouth. And the way that we determine bruxism is by putting leads on uh, the mandible. So we during a sleep study we put leads on the subentalus. This gives us a great view of when a patient is going to sleep. As they go to sleep, the chin tension lessens, and we'll see the little line get thinner and thinner. Um, also, this gives us a nice look when a patient does grind or brooks or put pressure down. We'll see a nice strong blip. We can put them on the masseters if we're looking for bruxism, but it doesn't respond the same way that the submentalis does. Uh, a lot of sleep techs prefer to put it on the submentalis because of that because it looks pretty. Um, it doesn't fluctuate much. Um, bruxism occur with leg movements or respiratory events, some sort of arousal. They very, very rarely, maybe 1% of all the studies I've seen has someone just had an independent Brooks, independent of some sort of uh, movement or airflow limitation. So Brooksism we have here, but you see it's part of an arousal. We got a little chin burst right there. And another one here, this is a little bit further out, but you can see um, we do have some airflow limitation or problem throughout here. So this is a little blip Brooksism right there. Notice it's not independent, it's coming with an arousal. And here in rim, we see the brux with this arousal. 
Boom. Okay. Now I'm shocked. We're we're getting we're getting close to the end here. So um you know it let's let's look at let's think about a car wreck. Let's say, of course, there's more than this, but 35 per year and in county. It only takes one of those 35 to cause a death. Um, the average speed is 45. Um, if you go 75 and and pass somebody, you may get a ticket. What do I mean by all of that? Little things can add up to big things. So just because um, just because the perception of sleep is not mainstream, being that flow limitation, air flow limitation is not mainstream. If you go to a hospital, you may not get treatment because they don't have anything outside of CPAP. That doesn't mean that it's not dangerous. Um, speeding. We all do it. I'm very guilty of that. But that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Everybody does it. We all have it. We have to kind of address it and look at it um, like that. So instances over averages. Um, so this is the workup. Patient has asthma, occasional flare-ups, history of loud snoring. The, the husband witnesses this. Daytime fatigue. She's got noticeable palpitations during the day. She's morbidly obese. Her in-office pulse rate is 81. Oxygen saturation is 98. So if we look at our sleep test, um, oh, nope. Golly. I'm sorry. This is a pediatric sleep test. That's not the right one. So what happened here was the physician, even though she had an AHI of five, the physician said that she had nothing. She had mild sleep apnea and she was fine, despite being extremely overweight and having all of these uh, signs and symptoms. Now, I will show you her sleep study. So this is her sleep study here. Every time she was on her back, she had a problem. But she also had a problem when she was on her side. We see snoring all throughout here. We actually see pulse rate fluctuation heavily through here. It's caterpillar-like. There's a lot of fluctuation there. The pulse rate should be flat for the most part throughout the night. So it rises here. Then she goes on her back. Then we got a lot of trouble and a lot of respiratory events. She's having hypopneas on her back. This would make me believe that she has a tongue tie because if she didn't, she would be having tremendous apneas all throughout the night. So this would be a patient that I would believe the tongue tie would be saving them, uh, kind of. Um, again, she goes on her left side. We kind of normalize a little bit. Still got some pretty significant snoring. We get on her back. This pulse rate again starts to go crazy. Even the oxygen saturation goes a little crazy. She goes on the right side. We get a little bit normal again until we get back to supine at the end there. So um, this story tells me everything I need to know that this patient does have trouble along with those signs and symptoms. And um, typically, and even I had to talk with the ENT last week who said a patient had an HI7 and he told her to get out of here because she was fine. So subjective complaints are a lot bigger than um, what, what can be presented. Problem there, problem there, snoring the whole night. So this is her breathing. This is when she's starting to fall asleep. We do have some snoring. She's on our left side. We can start to see some airflow limitations, but for the most part, she's pretty good. Um, these airflow limitations right here are causing some trouble. Now in two hours, she starts snoring heavily. Still on her left side, we're starting to see a lot more airflow limitation. Supine, mama hurting. She having a bad way. Um, a lot of side breaths and gas as the body's trying to normalize this breathing. SpO2 pleth is starting to be affected. You see the snores are starting to be sporadic because the airway is starting to become a lot more closed off. And then the end, on our left side, we still have snoring. Um, we still have a lot of airflow limitations. So if I were to look at this study, I would definitely say that you have a problem, um, not necessarily to get out of here. So uh, the show and tell, signs and symptoms. Um, <laughs> you know, a stitch in time saves nine. Shove it, Ben. This is kind of like my life. Like when I <laughs> talk about sleep to physicians, they're like, oh, what? Get out. Why do you do all that stuff? But this is all the signs and symptoms. Um, and I, I I should probably send you this. I actually was going to post this on Facebook um, in, a, in a PowerPoint because it's a lot to go through. But it breaks down how the body reacts to the sympathetic nervous system as a result 
of sleep disorder breathing or nocturnal breathing disturbance. And that's, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skim through this so I can talk about the case. I'm, I'm running up on my time. <laughs> so what's in this pudding, Tim? Proof. All right. So all this stuff I talk about, I ended up having to get a lot of proof for it. Not to prove people wrong, but to prove patients right. So a nine-year-old male, he was intubated as a baby. He got tracheomalacia from that. Tracheomalacia is a floppy airway, floppy trachea. And it causes problems. Of course, at night, it causes a tremendous amount of problems. They automatically qualify for CPAP when there's tracheomalacia. However, this young man, was uh, his mother took him to a few different physicians. They wouldn't even give him a sleep study. Um, if we actually look at him, we're going to see that these chronic migraines, sometimes he would have to go home from school, 25 attacks per month, or 25 attacks per month. Um, he's got a high arch palate, plus one tonsils, class three malampatic, increased buckle space. So these are all the signs, the classic signs of someone who has some sort of airway resistance or some sort of nocturnal breathing disturbance, mouth breathing while sleep and awake, somniloquy or sleep talking, and somnoambulism or sleepwalking. He does both. Bruxism, night terrors wakes three times a night to drink, attention deficit, and regular nasal congestion, not cure antihistamine. So just reading these things, I know that um, he's got a high vaulted palate. His nose is affected, so he may have a deviated septum. He's sleep deprived. Um, and his mouth is probably small. Um, so no need for a sleep study. They did an overnight oximetry, which showed it was negative. Of course it's negative. Um, and there's also a seven month wait for sleep studies here for a pediatric patient. So what does he look like? This is my man. He does have allergic sinus a little bit. If you look at his posture, he's leaning. If you look at this left eye, he's got more oomph on this side. So there may be some musculature lacking on that side. Um, we see the mouth kind of pulling down a little bit. If we look at him from the side, we see the low hyoid, the retronathia. Um, so the tongue is more in this airway. If he was out further, and he did have good tongue posture or tone, this would be a lot more flat. This little bulge is the tongue coming down, the hyoid pulling down, all that tissue kind of coming down. So uh, did a home sleep test. HI was 0 0.1. There was no significant desaturations, but there was increased movement. There was severe airflow limitation. There was gasping all throughout the night, and there was instances of severe tachycardia. So every time that he had an airflow limitation that led to an arousal, his pulse rate spike 25 beats per minute and greater. This is significant. Um, so I snuck him into a sleep lab to get him a in lab test, and his HI was one. HI of one for kids is mild sleep apnea. So if you look at the difference, his HI was 0 0.1 on a home sleep test and one in lab. I knew something was wrong based on everything that I saw with the findings, the pulse rate the movement, the side breaths, um, those things let me know that the airflow limitation was uh, um, something severe. So treated with CPAP, the mother decided against expansion. Um, what we found was we did a trial of CPAP for 30 days. I think it was 27 days or 28 days. He was great the next day. The two days or three days that he wasn't, he was at his grandmother's house or a friend's house and didn't use the CPAP. So I do not condone using CPAP on kids because it, it may retard the facial growth. Um, however, we wanted to see what would happen if we opened the airway. And um, we did have success with that. So a patient with extreme airflow limitation uh, with therapy ended up turning completely around. Um, the twins from the, the case study, almost exactly the same. They had some grown man apnea. Um, they were all around the city. ENTs and sleep docs wouldn't see him. They had high arch space, sunken orbits. The snoring was violent. Um, the mother recorded one of them snoring, and it was almost like a bucking kind of, almost exorcist-like type of type of snoring. And um, we did maxillary expansion. Uh, that reduced the AHI pretty tremendously. And then we did uh, TNA and finished everything out. Now, these kids... Um, I used to always see the mother because I still was going to that dental office and she still is so excited and happy that her kids are now growing. They do well in school. They do sports. They're always happy and they have a lot of energy for school and class and sports where before they did not.
So again, um, being able to understand and see things with the face makes a world of difference. And then, man, I had a lot on here. So this is good stuff though. So, <laughs> so the last one I'll talk about is eight year old young lady uh, that was on the spectrum. Uh, same story. The mother adopted her um, from the NICU uh, or her, she was in the NICU because her real mother was a uh, drug addict. So nurse adopted her. Um, physicians were trying to just control her with medication. Um, she was a little bit erratic. She didn't really talk much. She had some speech things going on. And so um, she was treated for attention deficit, hyperactivity, aggression, daytime sleepiness, and she had enuresis. So they were trying to control her with schizophrenia medicine. Um, kids on the spectrum do need melatonin because they don't produce melatonin like we all do. Um, there's mouth breathing congestion, um, very short attention span. So very hard to work with at a, a level of, of training and understanding. Well, did a sleep study on her. Her age, I was 12. This is on a home sleep test. So it was severe. Uh, we did TNA and her first words after the surgery were, mommy, I can breathe. I think we also did an upper lip tie release and a tongue tie release. Um, so being able to actually see a patient, being able to, to catch the signs of upper air resistance or that something is wrong, mid-face architecture deficiency, um, makes a world of difference for treatment and therapy. Okay, I'm done. Are you done? Yeah. Because I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Oh my gosh. I have I, like pages of notes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have a question then. I didn't Are you go done through or... the, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. We'll have a question. This is all references, the rest of it. Okay. okay. This was amazing. Before you turn off your screen share, could you go back to the slides that where it's like quacks like a duck? Um, yes. Okay. And then you don't have to go through them. But can you show, uh, okay, there we go. Just take a second on each one. So we can, are we allowed to like do a screenshot so we can read this over? I yes. need my post. Okay. That way yeah. I can like yeah. read this over. Okay. Go to the next, just go like each one and give it a couple seconds. Okay. High blood pressure stroke. This is great. Okay. Just the next one. I just want to be able to later when I watch this again on my phone, I'm going to screenshot it on my computer. Okay. There we go. Left in ghrelin. Okay. Memory, headaches, glaucoma. Okay. Cancer, heart disorder, failure, nocturnal urination. Okay. Weakened immune system. All right. A lot in there. Heart, hearing loss, death. Yep. Okay. And then this is a pediatric sparks like a fox. Okay. Okay. Hyperactivity, nasal congestion, bruxism, sleep talking, ear infections, soft tissue hypertrophy. Okay. The bedwetting. I'm writing a note here too to ask you a question. Okay. Next. And that's it. Perfect. Okay. You can turn off the screen share. And then do you have time for me to ask you a few questions? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. That was so good. Thank you <laughs> so much. That was so comprehensive, so detailed. I'm like, I have like so many notes here. I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay. Questions, questions. Okay. Ah, I don't even know where to start. Can you just talk about the asthma, the relationship between asthma and sleep disordered breathing? Yeah. So uh, that was a good question too, because the most common type of asthma is nocturnal asthma out of the three, the sports, the ambient or outside, you know, dander stuff, and then nocturnal asthma. Um, so what we find is that it ends up being more hyperactive airways. If the nose is not completely intact, if there's some sort of deficiency, it's going to cause the spasm of the airways. And typically that'll start happening at night congestion. So sometimes I'll tell a patient like either um, breathe right strip, and heavily mentholated cough drop, like before you go to sleep. So you can increase airflow and kind of stave off that congestion. So just the the uh, ineffectiveness of the nose, you don't warm and humidify air and that affects the lung architecture. It makes it spasm. 
So uh, that becomes the asthma. And would that only be related to nocturnal asthma or could it also be related to daytime asthma? The sleep also related to daytime. Also. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really important. Um, home sleep study. So whatever score you get on a home sleep study, would you expect it's going to be worse on an in-lab sleep study? Like, is that definitely? <laughs> so for adults, for adults, supposedly the home sleep test, and I'm going to tell you why the home sleep test for adults, the age would be greater than the home sleep test in the lab. And that's because if you have airflow limitation that leads to an arousal, and then you have a central apnea after that, they're going to mark either the computer or the person is going to mark that central apnea. So your tally is starting to get higher and higher. Um, if you don't, we don't know if you're awake or you're asleep, the system of breathing isn't taken in consideration. So when you're in a lab and we do see the EEG and we know that you're awake at this point, we can't mark a respiratory event. So yeah. Supposedly, the AHI for an adult would be more. On the other hand, the kids would be less. A home sleep test for kids, the AHI would be less than it would be in a lab. That's interesting. I never knew that. I always thought, oh, it's definitely going to be worse in a lab, but not true for adults. That is true mm -hmm. for children. And why is That's that right. for children? So for children, we can't score hypopneas. Um, we can't score all the hypopneas on a home sleep test because okay. uh, airflow limitation leading to an arousal is a hypopnea for a kid and we can't score arousals on a home sleep test. So the home sleep test would underscore it. Got it. Okay. That brings me to another question about children. Let's see where I put this in my notes. Um, okay. It's two missed breaths. So that is like, they just basically are attempting to breathe, but there's no airflow for the amount of time it would have been a breath, but twice. <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. That's right. That's that was the most exactly convoluted right. description. I just yeah. <laughs> so like you <laughs> no. kind of measure how often the child's breathing, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, like say it's however you know seconds, and then that just stops happening. But you see the effort or the belt. Yes. Okay. That's um, right. And then that results in either an arousal or a three percent desaturation for a child. Yes. Yep. Yep. For a hypopnea. Okay. So what about the sigh breath? Why do people mm -hmm. take sigh breaths? Because I need to watch my son sleep because I yeah. haven't done it recently, but he used to sigh a lot in his sleep. And I'm like, oh, he's good. He doesn't snore. He doesn't move much, but he would take it, do a deep sigh pretty often. Yeah. So the sigh breath is the body trying to shock itself back into. So you're with the airflow limitation, you're not getting the volume that your lungs want. The lungs are pulling, they're not getting that volume. So all of a sudden the body says, hey, listen, something's got to happen. So you you take a big breath in so you can get that volume. Okay. And then you exhale a lot. So um, I actually have a video, a patient sent me a video of their child um, doing a side breath. And they're on their back and the breathing looks fine. Everything looks fine. Then they sigh and you see them smacking. Yep. Sucking on the tongue to get the tongue out of the airway. Wow. So a sigh breath is pretty significant for a sleep disorder breathing issue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's really important information to know. Because so your child could sleep peacefully, soundly, like they're not restless, they're not snoring. But if you notice their size, or even mm -hmm. in an adult, that's a significant factor for a potential problem. Um, yes. Okay. Um, what about... Let's see, positional apnea. Okay, so I've had people mm -hmm. take a sleep study or go or go to a lab and the doctor says, oh, it's just positional apnea, just sleep on your side. Your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's true. But if you have apnea on your back, on your side, you're still going to have upper air resistance. Um, so we have to look at the pulse rate. If you go on your left side and like your pulse doesn't fluctuate at all, I say sleep on your left side. But if you're on your left side and you're snoring, and your pulse is fluctuating and you're sighing, then there's a problem. And one thing I want to, that's so good of a question because you have to think about the nose. If you're breathing through your nose, what if the left side is compromised? You're going to have trouble on your, on your right side. If the right side is compromised, you're going to have trouble on the left side because that's the side that's up. So we sleep in a 90 minute interval. So in 90 minutes, we go light, deep rim, light, deep rim, light, deep rim. Deep sleep gets shorter as the night goes on, rim gets longer. Um, at the point that we're light, we may switch body positions. 
But if we have some sort of nasal congestion, if we sleep on the left side, and um, I talk about the sides because the turbinates can swell with blood. And so if one side is more affected and it swells, then you're going to want to go to the other side. You're going to want to move. So positional therapy is only a thing if you are perfect on one side or the other. There's other factors that go into it. Yeah, I feel like I agree. Like that would be really rare for someone to just have positional apnea and be fine yeah. in all other positions. It's like, okay, well, the patient you showed that adult case, you said the tongue tie might be saving her. So she had, yes. can you explain that a little more? Yeah. So one way that I know a patient has a tongue tie is if they have a sleep study and they have a tremendous amount of upper air resistance. And then when they go on the REM sleep, they'll start having maybe apnea or more hypopnea because if they had a tongue tie release and that tongue tone is low, this tongue's just going to be slamming in the back of the throat the whole time. So the tongue tie is actually preventing the tongue from slamming into the back of the throat. So there's still resistance there, um, but it's preventing the apnea. Okay. And that would be maybe a patient who did not have myofunctional therapy because yes. with that therapy. Okay. So have you noticed any differences? I know it wouldn't be like research-based necessarily, but if you've yeah. ever like observed differences, someone who has a tongue tie release with myofunctional therapy, any sleep study differences? There is, they do have, so there still will be some upper air resistance, but it's dramatically less. Like, I mean, I, I just re just yesterday, I was reviewing a sleep study with a patient who had myo done and has a tongue tie. And I said, I mean, I honestly, only in certain instances do I really see you having a problem. But for the most part, I almost don't even see anything. So you can still have hypopneas and apneas, which probably will be occurring in REM sleep. And then when you're in non-REM sleep, like everything is good to go. And then so it does. Had it, the, they have the tongue tie release or they have the tongue tie with myofunctional therapy, but not released yet. Tongue tie with myofunctional therapy, not released yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I wonder when they get the release, we would expect, hopefully it would be even better, the airflow. Yeah, it should be perfect. Um, okay, I'm just like highlighting all the things that like really popped out where I wrote down, where I learned things or just is really interesting. Bruxism is not just caused by airflow resistance, but also leg movements, you said. Yeah. So someone so, who maybe has restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movement disorder, that could trigger the bruxism? It could. It could. Um, it's, it's just a response from the body. So um, bruxism occurs from um, stimulation of the central nervous system, which would be the sympathetic nervous system's portion of. So in order to get rid of bruxism, you would quell the central nervous system like you depress it. So any sort of movement or activity um, that makes you active may make you brux. Now, uh, the majority of these are subsequent to airflow limitation. Um, mm -hmm. In a patient that does not necessarily have, if they have more leg movements than they have airflow, airflow limitation, it's going to happen a lot because the body will arouse and they'll brux. But for patients that have airflow limitation, they, they brux a lot because every time that they have a side breath or a gas, there's potential for an arousal to follow that. And um, medications that can cause, is, is it SSRIs can increase bruxism? Um, oh, are there oh particular Lord. medications that could, or do you, I don't know if you know offhand, but. Um, no, um, I'm not sure. It's, uh, there's SSRIs will reduce the REM sleep, but okay. the bruxism, I'm not sure if they're increasing bruxism. Okay. I wasn't sure. Um, also nighttime bedwetting or just the need to urinate at night. Mm. I hear different, like people saying it's different causes. What would you say the, the causes are? So there's two. Um, I, I'm going to say that there's two that I know of. I'll say it that way. Um, one is the increased pressure on the heart. So as the lungs are pulling for breath, they're pulling for this volume they're squeezing the heart. The heart takes it as a fluid overload. It starts to increase the hormone AMP, AMP and BMP, atrial natriuretic peptide, brain natural. So that's linked to the heart. Um, and that makes you want to use the bathroom because it wants to get all that fluid off of the heart so it can respond, you know, naturally. It won't be squeezed. The other way is in the sympathetic nervous system, the detrusor muscle or the, the sphincter muscle of the bladder is um, closed. In parasympathetic, the rest and relax is open. So 
if you're having your sympathetic nervous system, if you have, if your autonomic nervous system is going from SNS to PNS and S, then it's going to keep opening and filling and closing, opening and filling, closing, open. It's going to make you want to use the bathroom. Okay. Okay. This is good. And is there something like, um, is serotonin, does that decrease? Is it like antidiuretic? And when you're in REM, oh man, or there's I don't something know. I don't know. I need to look that up. I remember something about that. Okay, this is great. Central apneas. I'm all over the place right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, so is that ever normal to have a central apnea? Like you said, it happens after a sigh breath. You might mm-hmm. have a central apnea until your body kind of um builds up the carbon dioxide. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. So our, our the normal range for carbon dioxide is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. And if you blow off too much, less than 35 or whatever your the normal is for your body, the brain is not going to tell you to breathe until you get to a higher level. So carbon dioxide actually triggers the breath. That w- that's what makes us ventilate. So in a patient with central apnea, let's say they do have a side breath, they got all this airflow limitation and they you blow off a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. Well, the brain's not going to tell you to breathe because there's no need. There's no carbon dioxide. Mm-hmm. So a central apnea will occur. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the primary central apnea, a patient is having some sort of physiological problem, um, either it be a stroke or a head injury or uh, fluid overload, something that mess the chemoreceptors up that gives okay. the messages to the brain. But yeah. otherwise, like a somewhat normal after like, even my son, I remember his sleep study, he had a few central apneas and they said, oh, that's normal. It's normal after an arousal. It's probably like what you're saying where you need to build up that carbon dioxide. Yes. And that you bring up some good points. So that's important too, because let's say, let's say your son has an A type two, but it was all centrals and they say, oh, well, this is a natural process of the body. Well, why did he have the side breath? Why do you have the side breath to the arousal to the central airflow limitation preceded that? So um, that's important to take into account when looking at pediatric studies. If there are all cent- if there are central apneas, there's potential for airflow limitation that causes them. And mm-hmm. in addition, on a pediatric sleep study in a lab, um, you know, one of the things they talk about with home sleep tests is they don't have carbon dioxide monitoring. Mm-hmm. Well, it's faulty. One, sometimes the techs don't want to fix it or change it. Two. Yeah then they also don't look at the full range of the carbon dioxide. They look at a level higher than this for five minutes or how long they look at lower. What if you're blowing off a bunch of carbon dioxide and your levels are lower? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to take into consideration uh, when you look at a a study that's just not in the normal verbiage. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like the words amygdala or amygdala depotentiate. I might (laughs) have to try to memorize that and copy it. (laughs) Because I love it because in that REM stage of sleep, that's when that whole um, limbic system, right? That part of the brain kind of where the amygdala are, are repairing, like you said, building synapses. That's where a lot of people who have PTSD or those depression, Mm -hmm. emotional issues, they're not um, depotentiating the amygdala. Is that right? That's right. That's right. That's 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 amazing. Um, and then nightmares happen in REM sleep, but night terrors happen in stage N3 deep sleep. That's yes. really interesting to know that difference. When I was a kid, I used to have tons of night terrors and mm. one of them I actually remember. So I don't know if a night terror can turn into a nightmare. <laughs> like, could you kind of come out? Yeah. Okay. It could because the, usually in a, in a perfect world, REM comes after deep sleep, just after. So, um, that potentially that you can transition like that. Okay. Especially if your brother's pouring a cup of water on your head, trying to wake you up because that's <laughs> yeah. what was happening. Cause he like woke me up, tried to wake me up, brought me into the bathroom, dumped water on my head. Cause um, I was having a night terror. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night terror, just freaked out. Like it was yeah. like in deep, deep fear. Like where am I? What's happening? So I guess you don't want to wake someone up in the middle of the night terror. Yeah, if you if you can help it, yeah. Um, okay. And let's see what else I was looking at. Okay, what do you know why they took away stage N4 sleep? No, I have no idea. And okay. you know it's important, but I have no idea. I mean, we still have it, it's just not labeled anymore. So it yeah. nobody it's not correct to say stage four sleep is REM. Or, That's right. Okay. So there's yeah. three stages of sleep plus REM. That's right. Okay. Yep. 
yeah, okay. rim is a light stage. Okay, another quote from you that I liked is um, flow limitation still has the same effect on physiology as apnea. Flow yes. limitation still has the same effect on physiology as apnea. That's important That's right. for everybody to understand. Okay, just because it's not showing up as apnea does not mean our patients do not have a problem. And most of them coming from myofunctional therapy do based on the yes. need of the soft tissue dysfunction. Um, I also learned kids on the spectrum need melatonin. That's yes. a thing. Yeah, they don't produce melatonin like everybody else. Really interesting. Okay, another thing that was interesting, everything was interesting, but melatonin temperature. So I know our body temperature, like you said, drops as you mm -hmm. get into the first stage of sleep. And that's how the melatonin can get released is as your body temperature drops. It's yeah, so um, uh, starting off at the day, you know, it's at the peak and the temperature starts to drop mm -hmm. and we get a big drop at around like one o'clock or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then the next big drop is around five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so we have these times kind of when we get sleepy, usually around the midday, especially after you cram a bunch of cars for lunch. And <laughs> then aye, the aye. last time is almost <laughs> like right before you go to sleep. <laughs> yep. Carb lover here. Yep. Okay. <laughs> And then that kind of helps yeah. trigger, like you get tired. So it's interesting because my son, this sounds a little weird, but he's 10. He wants to sleep with an ice pack. Like he'll mm. lay with an ice. So is his, is he like trying to help himself facilitate sleep and he maybe doesn't know why? Like, yeah, yeah. Unbeknownst to him. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's interesting. Um, also, okay. I like you said, pulse rate is the best indicator of trouble. Yes. Yeah. Um, the pulse don't lie. <laughs> yeah. The I remember oxygen. my sleep study when I did the sleep study in the lab here in San Diego, where they were just looking at oxygen drops. They said I was completely fine. H I was zero, but I was like, well, why is my pulse going to like over a hundred? And mm. I got on the elliptical at the gym and I did, I worked my pulse to that level. And I was like, yeah dang, that's happening when I'm sleeping. That's not yeah. okay. Like, how is that normal? Like go on the equipment and see what it takes to get your pulse to that rate and think when you're sleeping, it does that. That's not okay. So that yes. was indicator of trouble that was ignored on that first sleep study for me. Um, okay. So REM. Oh yeah. I think people confuse REM and say it's deep sleep. REM is light. Yeah. Sleep. yeah REM is light sleep. It's very fast brain activity. Um, so it, it's like, it's a really light stage. And then I think my last um, of all the things I wrote where I circled and put stars and all this stuff, um, the turbinates and vertigo. Okay. You said about how if the air, was it if your mouth breathing and the air hits the eustachian tubes too fast, that can cause vertigo or? If the, if the nose, um, so the, the turbinates help slow down the airflow that comes in. Okay. And if they're off or they don't have enough space, then the pressures are kind of off and they can smack into the eustachian tube and um, cause like dizziness or vertigo or there's a neurological term for it, um, but I can't remember Okay. what what it is. But and Okay, so in somebody that. who is a nose breather, an issue mm -hmm. with the turbinates could cause vertigo. Because, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, interesting. That's really fascinating. So that was such a great presentation. There was so much good information. I want to watch it again. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your true sleep course before we end everything? Oh, yeah. Um, so the true sleep course, it kind of takes you through everything in sleep diagnostics. So uh, the terms, how things are set up, why things the way they are, um, even the reporting. So kind of start to finish on, like you were on the inside, putting you on the inside of actually sleep diagnostics to give you a better understanding. Um, if there's 11, I think there's 11 courses, uh, seven hours total. There's there's maybe two that are like an hour or something like that, but all the rest of them are about 30 minutes. Um, but it gives you a ground level understanding of sleep diagnostics and um, understanding kind of why everything is the way it is in sleep diagnostics and, and understanding, getting a better clue on how to understand your patients and your own sleep studies. Yeah. I feel like this presentation right now that you did was like that course on steroids because it was like, <laughs> this was that. And now take the course 
and it is details of everything you talked about, but like extend it out. So I'm sure yeah. it's just so interesting. How do people find your course? So truesleepdiagnostics.com and uh, click on the course tab. Okay. And then you yeah. also, with your company, you do, you send take home sleep studies and you're able to look at them in that airflow resistance lens. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I do mail order home sleep testing. Um, this is a rough time of the year. Um, <laughs> so it's really backed up, but yes, I do take, I look at airflow limitation or airflow dynamics. Um, and I also, after I interpret it, I have my board certified sleep doc sign off on it, send it to the patient, send it to the referring provider. And most oftentimes I follow up with the patient to give them an understanding of what's going on. Um, because every patient I have comes from a provider and the provider is trying to tell them something and the provider may already have a plan, but the patient may not understand it or think that it's true. Uh, so we go through the whole thing and then I, will sometimes tell them what they may even look like based off of that airflow. Um, so my goal is really to help patients by helping providers help patients. So if like as a myofunctional therapist or um, if people are dental hygienists, dentists, if they have patients that might not go to a lab for a sleep study or might have done a take-home sleep study that their physician just says, oh, you're fine. The, the one that you will send home is more detailed because you're looking at it um, mm -hmm. from more of that airflow dynamics perspective. Yes. Yep. Okay. Same equipment, different eyes. There you go. Yep. Okay. And then because you have the board certified sleep physician, read it, sign off on it. Um, that can help the patient get services, whether they need a CPAP or that can help them get the diagnosis. Yes. Yep. Okay. That's right. So same thing, go to your website to connect with that or how do we? Yes. Yep. Um, truesleepdiagnostics.com. The front page has an order form, consent form. Um, I think my email is on there if you need to email me uh, or you can email through the website. And would you consider it, it's beyond a screening, but it's actually like a sleep study that. Uh, mm -hmm. OK. And yep. through like crossing states, is it OK for somebody in California to get that take home sleep study from you and signed off by your physician there, or does, does then the California doctors have to do their own? Test? It is, it's safe because, uh, because it's cash pay. Uh, okay. if it was insurance based, which is kind of how I was getting ready to start off, I would have to have a physician in every area or, uh, every state to, to be able to sign off. But since it's cash pay, we don't have to. Oh, that's good. Okay. Really great. Well, thank you so much for spending all this time with us. Um, it was so educational. Everybody should know this information, understand it, because most, I, I don't know if there's a percent, but I'm going to say like 90% <laughs> of our patients coming from myofunctional therapy, um, orthodontic treatment, have some form of airflow, airway resistance that are most likely affecting the quality of their sleep. So all this information is so important. So thank you so much for all of your time. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. You too. Take care. <laughs>